Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. One of my favorite things to do when looking at box scores is find the games that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. These are the games where you look at the stats and say, wait a second, how the heck did this team win the game? The games where one team completely dominates and yet still finds a way to lose. You got the Jaguars-Titans game from 2006, where the Jaguars had 396 yards of total offense compared to 98 for the Titans on just 5 first downs, and the Titans still won it 24-17. You got the Seahawks-Chiefs game from 1985, where the Chiefs had 165 yards of total offense compared to 369 for the Seahawks and turned it over 4 times, yet still won the game 28-7. And perhaps the most famous example of this was the Texans Steelers game from 2002, where Houston had three first downs and was outgained 422 to 47 in total yardage, and yet won it 24 to 6. But there is one of these games that has seemingly been forgotten throughout NFL history along those lines. In a 1978 game between the Philadelphia Eagles and the Green Bay Packers, the Packers had over two and a half times the yardage that the Eagles did. Philadelphia averaged around 1.5 yards per carry. Almost everyone in Philadelphia was hurt in some kind of way. And yet, despite not even putting up 150 yards of total offense compared to the near 400 yards that the Packers put up, the Eagles still found a way to win it against all odds. And this is the story behind what might be the most surprising win in Eagles history. Before I talk about the actual game, we need some context leading up to the game. It's November 5th, 1978, and the Philadelphia Eagles are hosting the Green Bay Packers in a critical NFC matchup for both sides. For Green Bay, they're doing surprisingly well. After five straight losing seasons, the Packers find themselves atop the NFC Central with a 7-2 record, and tied with Washington and Los Angeles for the best record in the entire conference. However, even with a two-game cushion atop the division, they don't have a whole lot of wiggle room. So a win here by Green Bay would go a long way to helping solidify a spot in the postseason for the first time since 1972. But for the team that's the main subject of our story today, this game is the definition of a must-win. Philadelphia enters this one with a 4-5 record. The battle for the wild card is ultra-competitive. You got the New York Giants at 5-4, the Vikings at 5-4, the Falcons at 5-4, the Saints at 5-4, and, and the Buccaneers at 4-5 while fighting for the final spot. Philly needs this game. They might have room to drop one game the rest of the way if they want to make it to the postseason. It was going to be a tall order to beat this Green Bay team, but it was one that was necessary if they wanted to be playing January football and make the postseason for the first time since 1960. And unfortunately for Philly, they were completely beaten up. If they were going to win this one, they were going to have to do it with an injured squad. The previous week against the St. Louis Cardinals, they lost 16-10, and all four of their running backs got hurt. Wilbur Montgomery, Cleveland Franklin, Jim Bederson, and Billy Canfield all got injured. It got so bad that in the week leading up to the Green Bay game, head coach Dick Vermeule signed Louis Jamona, a 180-pound running back who Vermeule only knew about because he was his nephew. Jamona was the only running back in practice all week. And on the defensive side, linebacker Bill Berge was playing with such bad back spasms that the Eagles put in a $500 electric simulator in his shoulder pads to give him shocks during the game. When one reporter asked what happens if it rains, Bergie looked shocked and said, I hadn't thought about that, which is a pretty big oversight to say the least. With that as the build-up to the game, it was time to play some football. And the Eagles were about to stun everyone, not just because they won, but because of how they won. Because despite being dominated, the Eagles still found a way to win in absolutely bizarre fashion. The Eagles get the ball to start the game off. On the first drive, they're forced to punt with the play ending the drive being a one-yard run when Philly needed two yards for the first down. This inability to run the ball will be a pretty common theme, as it didn't help that Canfield and Franklin were not even close to full strength thanks to their injuries the week before, and the fact that Green Bay's run defense at the time was pretty good, holding the Vikings to less than two yards per carry in Week 8, and the Buccaneers to 2.1 yards per carry in Week 9. Green Bay is able to move the ball deep into Philadelphia territory after this 50-yard catch by Turnell Middleton. This was the longest catch of his seven-year career, so you're witnessing a bit of history right here. Chester Marcole was able to drill a 42-yard field goal later in the drive to give Green Bay an early 3-0 lead. Not a good start for the Eagles, especially since Green Bay won all seven of their games so far in 1978 after scoring first, and dating back to last season, had won their last nine games when putting the first points of the game on the board. Second drive for the Eagles, and once again they're forced to punt. Once again, the drive ends with the Eagles running the ball on third down, and the Eagles getting completely stuffed at the line of scrimmage. Green Bay looks like they're going to strike again, as David Whitehurst, looking for his first touchdown pass in nearly a month, delivers an 80-yard throw to eventual Hall of Famer James Lofton. The Eagles get bailed out, as it gets called back for holding. And speaking of the Eagles getting a lifeline, even though Green Bay is able to advance into Philadelphia territory with ease, Whitehurst overthrows Barty Smith, and the pass gets picked off by Bill Berge. It doesn't matter a whole lot, as Philly gives it back on the very next play after this interception thrown by Ron Jaworski. 
As a side note, I made a video about Jaworski's tenure with the Eagles, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Three drives, and Philly has been unable to do anything. After Green Bay gets into Philadelphia territory yet again but doesn't do anything, the Eagles are once again forced to punt on their fourth drive. However, the Eagles are about to get a lifeline. David Beverly can't feel the snap, and tries to kick it on the ground, failing absolutely miserably. Philly hadn't entered the red zone all day, or even come close to doing it. Now, despite getting completely outplayed, they had a chance to take the lead and stun just about everyone. Before I talk about the play that happens here, let's talk about John Scara, the man under center. You could consider him to be the original Taysom Hill. In this game, he was an option quarterback, was a cornerback who played in nickel packages, a holder on field goals and extra points, and a punt returner. At one point, Scara played six positions in a single game. For real like Scara and wanted to utilize his speed and talent as an option quarterback which not everyone was too thrilled about. Case in point, Ron Jaworski, who said afterwards that no quarterback likes coming out of the game, and said that the team had been stopped quite a bit when running the option. But on this play, it worked wonders. Scar is shaped away from Gary Weaver and turned what could have been a 10-yard loss into a stunning two-yard touchdown. One of the longest two-yard rushing touchdowns in NFL history, but it counts for six all the same. After the extra point, the Eagles somehow led it 7-3, despite doing nothing all game. Now it was just a matter of holding on to the lead. And sure enough, that's exactly what they did, though they definitely didn't make it easy. Green Bay gets into Philadelphia territory on the next drive. They get no points, with Marcole missing his end of the half field goal attempt wide to the left. At halftime, the Eagles had a four point lead despite five first downs and despite being outgained 231 to 83 in total yardage. That's nearly triple the yardage, and yet they were winning. With the Packers getting the ball to start the second half, they enter Philadelphia territory again. It results in nothing after the Packers go for it on fourth and inches and fall short. Philadelphia goes 3 and out, but the Eagle defense forces a turnover to give the offense great field position. The drive ends with Nick McMeyer hitting a 27-yard field goal to extend the lead to 10-3. Green Bay gets into Philadelphia territory on their next drive, because of course they do, and once again, they wind up with nothing after coming up short on fourth down. Two drives later, Green Bay gets into Philadelphia territory again. Stop me if you heard that one before. Once again, no points. And on the next drive, it's the same thing. The Packers get into Philadelphia territory with under two minutes to go, and they're unable to walk away with anything, as an interception by Herm Edwards ends the game. When all was said and done, the Eagles, somehow, won this one 10 3 And afterwards, despite being completely dominated, all the talk was about how the heck they won that one. Green Bay had three drives all day that did not wind up in Philadelphia territory. Conversely, the Eagles' only points of the game came when they started deep in Green Bay territory as they could not sustain a drive to save their lives. If I told you this box score comparison, who would you say won the game, knowing nothing else? Green Bay had 174 rushing yards on 36 carries, an average of 4.8 yards per carry. Philadelphia had 51 rushing yards on 30 carries, which is an average of 1.7 yards per carry. Green Bay had 211 net passing yards, while Philadelphia had 97. Green Bay had 385 yards of total offense, while Philadelphia had 148. Philadelphia had one run go longer than five yards, and their longest run of the game was a mere eight yards. And yet, despite all of that, the Eagles won this game, because of course they did. Even Dick Vermeil said afterwards that there was a lot of luck involved, and that the Eagles were very fortunate to win, which seems like a massive understatement after looking at the box score. But that raises one final question. Even though this game helped propel Philadelphia to make a playoff run, and began a collapse for the Packers where they wound up missing the postseason entirely, why has this game been forgotten throughout NFL history? Despite the huge box score discrepancy, why is it that when we talk about surprising box scores like the Texans Steelers game and the Jaguars Titans game, that this one doesn't get mentioned? Well, the Eagles only have themselves to blame. Because despite this game being incredibly shocking, they had a different kind of shocking victory two weeks later that you may have heard of that completely overshadowed this game. Because two weeks later, the miracle at the Meadowlands happened. And considering how iconic that finish was, and how that game completely changed NFL history and how coaches call those victory formation situations now, it's easy to see why this Packers game, as crazy and as ridiculous as it was, got put on the back burner. But this game just goes to show you that sometimes, the box score lies and doesn't tell the true story of a game. Yards and yards per carry and first downs and stats like that are nice and all, but when all is said and done, the only number that matters is the final score. And on this day in 1978, the Eagles pulled off one of the most shocking final scores in their franchise's long history. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. 
And be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jarrogator 9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who helped get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.